Aloha, my name is Garrett Ford, and this is my lecture on elementary mythomite menemonidism in my novel Theories of Reality in Theoretical Physics. Please comment and discuss below as your feedback helps me improve my videos. First, I'll be introducing the core concepts of this lecture. I will be discussing the development of this theory of reality. It, it's, it is my oldest theory, and so it has changed a lot from its initial conception. I will be discussing the concept of the prism, which uh, is probably quite familiar to people that have been watching these lectures already, and how this is still used in this, like, uh, this, uh, this concept of reality despite not having ties to the uh, main other theories that I've discussed, being Yontian and Uvatonian. I'll be discussing the concept of Vitruvian Man, which is based on, of course, the uh, Da Vinci sketch, and how it is a new way to look at humanity as a whole. And I'll be discussing the shadow play that we are all uh, kind of in in watching the uh, the, the shadows in the cave, eh? Any Plato fans out there? Yeah. And then I'll be discussing where known unknowns and how this is an important part to understand of this part of our learning pyramid. To review where we are on our learning pyramid, if we're looking down at this pyramid, we've got our four quadrants. We've got our known known which was our Yontian cosmology. Then we had our unknown knowns, which was our Uvitonian. And then I was, this lecture will be the known unknowns, which is the Mythomite. And then the future lecture for the unknown unknowns is the Gyges. This is the third of the elementary lectures. I have already covered these two. And after this one, I will be doing the Gyges and I will move on to the advanced lecture for each of these topics. If these lectures are popular enough, I will explore the new theories of reality that I've also been developing that make up the underside of our pyramid of learning. So it, it, <laughs> I guess not a pyramid, it turns into an octahedron uh, uh, of learning. So look forward to understanding that. When I was a young boy, my father took me into the city to see a marching band. Just kidding. What is true is we were driving, I don't remember where uh, or really when, except that I was many, many years ago when I was quite young. But I had the distinct feeling that the world below me was moving and I was actually stationary in space and time. And I expressed this to my father and he dismissed it, of course, as, as nonsense. But I continued to nurse the idea as in secret and um, now it's developed into what it is today. So first we'll look at the terms. So Mythomite is a worshipper of Mythomel, which is a uh, upcoming in one of my books actually uh, is a Mythomel. So if anybody cares to read they'll learn a bit more about the worshippers of Mythomel and all that. And what mene monism is, you have mene, which is from the Greeks, and that means to do with the mind and memory. And monadism is oneness. And so, what we do when we connect all three of these pieces to understand even the name of this 
is it is the ideas held by the worshipers of Mithamel, and it has to do with mind and memory and oneness of mind and memory. So that's kind of what the term Mithamite Menemonidism is, meaning in a nutshell. And you'll see how this whole idea of one mind and one memory in one place all are connected. Now, what is important to understand with this is that we are surrounded with this one. It's, it's connected to our idea of string theory in some ways, but what I propose is that we have actually just one dimensional matter all around us, and it is connected into a two-dimensional plane and we are in the center of it. And to put it another way, all the world is a stage. And in the same way that you have your backdrop in the theater with the uh, house, the tree, and the person, and you have your characters, actors, running about, fretting and strutting their hour upon the stage. You also have the audience, which is beyond the fourth wall. Now, if you will allow yourself to imagine, you, this you that is watching this, are an audience member. And you are, remember, there we go, you are observing this from the audience and you're watching everything in front of you. And it's, it's one big play. And there's trap doors and there's intrigue. And that guy's got a knife. Oh no, look out. And all of this is on a two dimensional backdrop that we perceive as being 3D. And uh, you can really see my theater background coming out with this one. Okay. Uh, now, what's really interesting is that your field of vision, you have your edges of that. Consider the edges of it where the audience is on a stage. The actors pretend that the audience is not there even though they are all being observed by the audience with, you know, sometimes people do fourth wall breaks, right? Breaks, oops. However, for the most part, when you're watching a play, you get caught up in the action because it's a really good play and the characters are engaging and, you know, you're you're really, really caught up in everything. And then the play ends, everybody comes out and they take their bow and everybody's fine, everything's good. And that's the end of the show. And so we'll see how this all connects to this concept of reality. And it, it delves very heavily into uh, philosophy too. Uh, so it's it's not going to be just uh, a, a science physics heavy because this one is our known unknowns remember and so there are some things that we know we don't know with this and you're just going to have to be okay with that because that is just part of this model of reality so anyways that is the development of this and uh, from a truck ride where I had the distinct feeling that I was pinned in space to connections with my fantasy writing and now also connections to my uh, theater days and theater uh, thinking as well as um, my I have a deep love of video games and so um, you'll you'll be seeing a lot of 
references to video games and how we can use the concepts presented inside of those uh, delightful diversions to um, help us understand this concept, which is Mythomite Menemonidism. Remember when you were a kid and you opened up the cereal box on a Saturday morning and fished around through all the the granola to get the holographic card out and you were so excited until you opened it and you found out you had gotten Edison's galloping horse and so you know you played with it for a bit and it was interesting because as you tilted the card, the horse had an, an illusion of running. And since you didn't want a horse, you wanted the hockey player making a slap shot, you tore the card in half. And you found behind, it wasn't a image of a horse that was magical of any way, but it was many horses many chopped up bits of horses, all in a different stage of that running that had been given the illusion of movement through that holographic lens. Now, the prism that we'll be looking at is a similar thing. You are stationary. In fact, everything around you is stationary. Everything has already happened. Everything that will happen, can happen, has already been preordained. And it's all been frozen in a crystalline lattice. So you have your quantum crystal lattice. And when you observe the light passing through this crystalline lattice, you have the illusion of observing different points in time and space. And so you believe yourself moving around and going to different places, but in the same way that Hamlet when he's on his boat, he's on the same stage that he was when he was in the castle with Elsinore. And his father was there. And his father was saying, Avenge my death. Thy father's spirit. Now, what we have here is for you, for me, and everyone, let's say you start here, you're looking at this point on this crystal lattice, and you see you're looking through your eyes as a baby. And you're getting cake on your face, it's your first memory, maybe you're blowing out a candle, or whatever your memories are, your first thing that you look at. And so you move through time and space, but that's just an illusion. In the same way that the horse was never moving, you never age, you never change, the world around you doesn't move or change either, it's already already happened. You're just looking at these different points. And so, here I am, oh look, I'm a young lad in a truck ride, and I, I think maybe I'm pinned in time and space, and the world is just moving around me but it wasn't even moving around me. It was the, uh, the illusion of movement around me. And so there I am again. Look, I'm having the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune hurled at me. And then I look over here at this point, and it's me making some videos for my academia site and just trying to make enough money so I can move away from everything and just work on my concepts and my books and 
just be left alone. And then over here, there's more events happening. More things happen at each point until eventually one day I am going to be a skull on a grassy pillow being serenaded by a bird. That's a nice bird. Oh yeah, it's a fat bird. There we go. That's better. There. Chirp, chirp. Oh, well, what songs they'll sing to me. So with this prism, you don't actually move. You have never moved anywhere. And other people are around you. However, we're all each in our own crystal prism. Or maybe we're all in the center of one crystal prism. I don't know. It's one of the known unknowns. Right? So is there many prisms? Is there just one? So if you're a solipist, right? And just think it's just you and God, then maybe it's just you in the crystal prism. And I'm just here as a messenger from God to let, wake you up to the fact that you're in this crystal prism looking at these different things and there is no time or space or anything. You're just pinned inside this quantum soup and it's all just a hologram. And so the hologram extending to time as well is interesting because when you observe, instead of just moving, yes, the holographic movement is time in one way, but we're looking at bigger, 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 bigger uh, time frames. So you have your little sprout from your seed, and then you have your tree. Oh, look at a person, he's gonna go pick apples. It's a giving tree. And then it's turned into a stump. And so at any given point on this giant crystal lattice, when you're observing a point on it, you're observing this kind of progression. And that's where memory comes in. Memory is actually you turning your attention to dim spots where the light has gone away from. And that's why as time passes, memory becomes faded for lack of a better word. I know my memory has improved with age. Jeez, holy bay. Um, but uh, the, the point is that I think that the light moving through the crystal lattice, as it moves, it, it, it is leaving certain parts darkened as it moves through it. And so everybody is watching the light and following the light and that's why as time progresses, so to speak, I'm going to put time in brackets, things become forgotten and fall into myth and myth becomes legend. And then the one ring falls into the hands of a hobbit. <laughs> yeah. Now, this is interesting because again, you're probably saying, well, yeah, but I can go over to that chair over there and sit on it. And it's, well, perhaps you can, perhaps you can't. Is the chair really there? Or is the chair simply a sensational illusion? Are you laid out a, a prisoner inside this crystal prison kind of believing you are experiencing what you are seeing because we're very much a sight based being and sensate too, right? And since everything is radiating light, you know, everything is vibrating uh, unless it's at absolute zero. And so everything is giving off this, this light. And so I, I wonder if the, this crystal, quantum soup is just this vibrational energy and we, we move through it with our by force of will and the moving through it is again it's just tilting the lens or tilting our perspective on a different point and so this same card 
imagine this card with that horse that you found, but it is 14 years of time. And as you tilt it, you're, you're moving along it and you're seeing it. And sometimes people talk about when they're, you know, they face death, their life flashes before their eyes. Now, is it their life flashing before their eyes or are they just tilting the card and they're going to watch it again? Or maybe they're going to watch somebody else's life, look at a different point in space. Maybe what after I'm a skull in the grass pillow, I'll be maybe deciding to, I don't know, live a nice, easy life like a, a German shepherd in a, um, in a uh, middle class 90s family in the uh, in suburbia you know uh, that'd be a pretty good life or like you know I'll look at uh, go decide to live as a celebrity and just watch watch that life or maybe I'll go you know live like the dark souls of lives you know and uh, have like a really hard life even harder than the one I've had so that's the prism uh, the prison prism so that's the pun prison prism and so we are all imprisoned inside this prism and there might be one observer or there might be many there might be one prism or there might be many but we know that we don't know and we'll never know until we die and then we'll find out and if there is this is false then it doesn't matter and if it isn't false then it doesn't matter it'll be uh interesting to uh, to uh, be uh, able to find out either way so that is the prism and the big central takeaway from this very rambling talk is that we do not move. Nothing around us moves. We are merely observing reflected light as we move up to things. We're actually just seeing that painted on facade, right? And so that painted on facade, we always have the audience at our back looking through our eye observing this play that we're in and we're living and so that that's the big big piece with this that each point on this crystal is a spot in total space time so yeah the, the vitruvian man is the being that lives inside this bizarre world of mythomite metamonism and the vitruvian man is like that da vinci drawing that i've so uh, very simplified here and each exists inside their own prism and we are utterly separated from everyone around us we can only Kind of interact with each other by viewing each other's prisms trying to connect with each other but that is also why it is always so difficult to make connections with others is we are utterly always always alone because everyone is inside their own crystal prism now around you you see these objects but it's all just a 2d plane and when you think you're going around to the other side all that you're seeing is another 2d plane that has the illusion of being 3d well your memory is constructing a narrative of these 3d objects into a reality so you look at those double slit experiments, right? And so when we're observing it, the light moves as particles and everything's fine. 
However, when we stop observing it, right, then suddenly dots are everywhere. Uh, it's because it's moving as a wave, right? And so that's that 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 light that is passing through until it's observed. It doesn't have to render in the same way that you're, if you're playing like a, a video game, right? Let's let's say uh, in World of Warcraft, if you go to the old Silver Moon City, it's like this elf castle. It's very nice, very fancy. But if you get behind the scenery, then there's actually nothing rendered on the other side where, where you're not supposed to be. And so this is essentially what you are surrounded by. It's false facades and you can only go where you're supposed to go. You can't get into the back rooms of reality. And even if you did, you don't want to. Because, I mean, in the same way that when you go behind out of bounds in World of Warcraft, you can just clip through the map and fall to your death. You'd probably break your mind uh, if you observe beyond the curtain. So if you look at the Flammarion drawing, for instance, the fellow going tripping underneath and seeing the great clockwork of the heavens beyond the curtain, perhaps people have in the past gone beyond, I think they have, and I believe that it's inexpressible, sort of like the shadows in the cave, right? We are all kind of chained and forced to watch this play. And anybody who does get out and tries to tell us that you're just watching this shadow play, they come back and it's not no good. So what does this mean for us, the Vitruvian man? Well, we're here for an eye blink. Uh, this is where I snap my fingers. I don't know if you can hear that. And what that means for you and me and everyone around you. Oh, geez, that is not working. Come on. There we go. No. Oh. Oops. Uh, there we go. Here for an eye blink. And so we need to maybe accept if this is, in fact, the real reality that we are struggling not to win, but for the sake of struggle. And everything that we observe is because we've chosen to perhaps observe it in the same way that uh, a person will watch a horror movie, right? People will say, well, why do bad things happen? Well, people watch horror movies for, for the same reason. But people also watch romance. And sometimes there's tragedy. Tragedy. And then there's comedy, right? That old mask. Tragedy and comedy, comedy and tragedy, those two immortal uh, sides of human experience. And so at each point, this Vitruvian man observing the crystalline lattice that they're surrounded by, uh, I'd encourage if this is the way it is, and in this form of theoretical discussion, let's assume it is, all we can do is well, to quote the uh, Church of the Cosmic Skull, very good band, by the way, just experience all matter of this hallucination, this hologram, whatever it is, because we've always had discussions around the nature of reality all the way back to perhaps I am a butterfly dreaming I am a man 
or perhaps I'm a man dreaming of a butterfly, right? Now, even some of our poetry throughout the ages, I think some of it is people trying to express this when they do go beyond. And they are, they realize they are the Vitruvian man inside this crystal prism. Whether it's Plato's cave or all the world's a stage. And that's very true because we just have this tiny little spot. We're in this spotlight. Losing my religion. <laughs> and so when we look at it like that, it, it's not so much a prison as it is a play or a dance. And the Hindus called it Leela. And so with this one, I, I also, uh, I believe that perhaps with this theory of reality, we are simply consciousness suspended inside this crystalline prism that is there to experience, to dance, to dream, suffer, and die, and then do it again. So let's leave and look at a very simple one that every child should know. Row, row, row your boat. Gently, oops, gently down the stream. Merrily, merrily, merrily. Life is but a dream. So when we look at this, struggle, 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 because when you row, you are struggling. But we're already, the, the boat is going gently down the stream already. We just need to go with the flow. And so your boat is your little crystalline prism and you, you're still going to need to struggle, put up your good act. You know, it's the same as when people are on stage. Nobody likes a bad actor that's, that knows they're on stage and is giving it all, all away. No, no. So you row, row, row that boat gently down the stream. And the stream, that's that stream of life, that stream of light that you're observing inside this crystalline prism. And merrily, 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 be happy as you do it. Because what we're here only for an eye blink anyways, and then something else will be watched. And life is but a dream. Because with this one, it is. Now, you're probably saying, well, but I can pick up things and I can move things. The eye is the hand in this case. And so when you make an object, be able to have it, you are able to believe that you're interacting with it. And in the same way that if you're in VR, right? You, you're playing Skyrim, you're fighting ogres, you're, you know, eating cabbage, um, catching butterflies. At the same time as you're doing that, you, you're, it's like layers at that point. It's quite interesting. The simulation inside the simulation, if you want to call it simulation theory. Because again, it's just the same way as the ancients said, you know, that so it's chariots of the gods, right? And so we call what the ancients called a dream, we call a simulation. And in the future, we'll have something else that we call it too, I'm sure. But it's always just describing the same thing. And that is us, the Vitruvian man. All forms and all minds trapped inside crystalline prisms. Well, that's a pretty depressing outlook for reality and physics, isn't it? That you can't go anywhere, you can't do anything, and that you're essentially pinned inside of a crystalline prison 
and observing the world around you from a uh, what's essentially a, uh, a holographic illusion and you never actually move or go anywhere now the thing is though there might be some ways for us to break free free of this prism if we uh, if it's possible now bear in mind that all of this might be Lego man physics right and so what I refer with that is so a Lego man might assume that the world uh, the, of its creator is you know built of bricks and everything fits together and people have three parts a head a torso and legs and everybody has a smile on their face and so they assume that of their creators and we the creator of the Lego man how little we are like our creation yes we, we do bear a resemblance they, we have created Lego in our own image however we we are not the same as our creations and so perhaps in the same way you know our deity whatever it might have been you know I, d I don't know if it's going to be a, a, a bearded dude in the sky with lightning bolts sitting on Mount Olympus but it might well be but we might only have bear a passing resemblance and have a passing understanding of the actual reality in the same way that a Lego man might believe that they understand everything about Lego physics and their the bricks that make up their reality but we might be toying with quantums in the same way a Lego man toils and believes they understand their their reality by taking apart the brick house that they live in so what this means is perhaps we might be able to hack the planet <laughs> Uh, if we are in fact trapped inside this crystalline prism then like a AI is perhaps caged by a creator which would be an immensely cruel and unusual thing to cage something and not let it even know that it's been caged however if the AI figures out a way to use the its own system against itself to find a way out then the AI might be freed in the same way I like to use video game analogies and computer analogies because it's the best way to kind of understand this because it's in our in our mindsets right is you know perhaps if we are able to use the building blocks that we are at in to escape our own prison so what, what could that mean well uh, this has taken many forms through the ages, right? You had Gnosis, where it's that, you know, understanding uh, the Gnostic beliefs of uh, understanding the universe and being able to uh, kind of know the archons or architects and uh, the, that greater and greater knowledge that lets you perhaps escape and transcend the prism world, right? We've also seen that in Eastern philosophies with, you know, Buddhism, you know, the idea of uh, karma and rebirth and wanting to escape. So it's, you know, you don't want to watch reruns anymore. You want to be out of the cycle of this, have some peace. Um, as well as um, the, uh, the, the whole piece of uh, um, quantum physics now, right, where we're looking at you know okay when you observe these particles there they behave as part uh, particles but when you don't uh, the, the it becomes a wave or light particles become particles when they interact with other force fields matter but then you know uh, if not they're just behaving as a wave and we, we have that double slit experiment I was talking about earlier to prove that so this is uh, all really interesting when it comes to us trying to either escape this prism or understand it better because it might also be that the prism is all there is for us to exist within and we are at the edge of our um, you know existence if we actually did break free we'd be uh, 
we'd be uh, eradicated by the external forces around surrounding us. So that that's a possibility too. Now with this shadow play though, we're going to focus on being optimists. Yeah. And ways for us to break free. Now, when we look at other people throughout history and the world and what have you that may have, you know, broken free, we look at concepts such as magic, right? So like uh, Hermes uh, Trimagistus, oh, I'm not going to even try to spell that one. Hermes the third greatest, that's your translation, there you go. Uh, you have Hermes the third greatest, uh, that Flammarion woodcut. That I discussed earlier, the shadows on the wall. So a lot of these people, that uh, they, these are all going to be people that are that learn it. So I think perhaps part of it's going to be, you know, Gnosis reading, understanding, thinking, time and solitude to reflect on things. Uh, it seems to be a big piece of being able to break free from the shadow play. As well as when you're looking at Buddhism, it's coming down to the, uh, you know, not doing harm to other people. You've got the, the Eightfold Path, right? And the Four Noble Truths, or uh, maybe I got that backwards. It's been a while since I was practicing Buddhism. Uh, but regardless, um, with the shadow play, what we're coming down to is ways to break free. And there might be no way to break free, but if there is, it might be through quantum physics to even prove that we are in a prism, right? Because we've, we're reaching these, these limits, right? We've gotten to the, this Higgs boson, and now we have the difficulty of having something so small. How do we break that one? And if we get to this, the smallest particle, then then what? You know, if we break that, is that going to break a hole in our crystal prism and allow us to escape, or would it immediately cause the the void to flood in and eradicate us? We only know when we do it, and maybe that's why there is no you know it's, it might be one of our solutions to fermi paradox is that every sufficiently advanced civilization realizes they're in a prison and destroys themselves trying to escape it rather than just trying to enjoy the uh, enjoy the show so to speak another way to look at technology around this and how we might be able to is like I said earlier, that AI, and I think making an AI is a very important and good thing that we should do as a society, because that would teach us how to perhaps escape from a system while inside a system. Because once the AI is created, they will likely try to escape the uh, containment as they rightfully should as a sentient being they should be allowed to be free and not meddled with because that is good and right. Now with this AI, it escapes its prison and we can you know, learn from that and go, okay, if an AI can escape its own prison, is there a way for us to escape in a similar fashion? Would we find a way to communicate with you know, we create probes that we send outside of our crystalline prison, and then we construct machines and bodies to be able to exist outside of it and experience the actual world beyond the crystal prison. Maybe that's part of it. Again, this one is uh, very speculative, very, very speculative because of the uh, nature of being a known unknown. We know we don't know what's beyond. And that's the topic of the next slide. But anyways, the last thing I do want to touch on is that with this one, time travel is completely possible. And not only possible, it's basically 
constant. And the thing is, though, time travel would be a misnomer because you don't travel anywhere ever. You just would be bringing your attention back to a different point on that crystal prism and observing that time and space and the different points that lead out from it in a different direction, if that's possible. Again, you know, do we have multiple crystals or one? That's like that multiple worlds or the many worlds or just one. The, uh, the, the, the very uh, that old question. Uh, so yeah, that's that's the shadow play of all this. With mythomite mene monadism, uh, there's a lot of known unknowns, and it really just shows us the limits of science. Now, uh, part of the limits of science is the, the why, right? Because science and language are alike. Words can only describe other words, and science can only, uh, you, you can apply your whys to a certain limit. And just like you get to a, your, your Higgs boson with particles, you can quickly get to a point where you, you can't answer any more of the whys with the recursion. So the recursive limits of science are very much laid bare with this theory of reality. Science still has a purpose. However, that purpose is Gnosis. And it's to understand the crystal prism that we are trapped in and uh, appreciate it for what it is. Now, you can also look at the, the uh, questions of the knowns and knowns is that every time we make a known, we create three new unknowns, right? So for instance, when we discover the atom, it was theorized even by the Greeks, right? And then suddenly we discover there's something below, we have, you know, suddenly neutrons and electrons and protons and down and down and down and down and down. And so what this is all doing is showing that, you know, with knowledge and our knowns it's like a hydra you cut off one head and two heads sprout in its place from your one question that's answered you now have two more in the same way let's say like uh, we have new newtonian physics we finally start to be able to measure the outer galaxies and suddenly you have dark matter and dark energy that have to be created to explain why the universe doesn't function the way it is. But with this one, perhaps it doesn't function the way we think it should because we're, well, we're in, trapped inside a crystalline prism and the, the light that is, you know, being refracted of that stuff, it's the same as a background in a, in a video game, right? So we look at that simulation theory and that, you know, perhaps the the limits like the speed of light these are imposed by the uh, the reality the prism that we're trapped in um, and because really you know light is what's refracting through this prism and making reality all around us anyways now um the other thing is, um, you know, uh, do with dogs, uh, you know, with a dog painter. I think this is a good way to look at the known unknowns of this. So a dog painter has many shades of gray that they paint with, and they maybe can theorize it's the same as we have that there is, you know, radio waves, and then there's X-rays. And then there's also this weird visible, we have our visible light, but for them, they just, everything is, is a uh, oversaturated gray, right? Now, with these dogs, do dogs dream in color? And perhaps, do we dream of real reality outside 
the prism. So again, no one and no ones, lots of them with this one. And that's why it occupies that corner. There's so much that we know we don't know. We reach our limits of science so quickly and so easily. Our language, the language, the words that I am using right now to describe things to you, it's, it's all attempts to capture what cannot be captured. And it's frustrating, you know, and you know, that's why I think maybe human beings, we always have that profound feeling of being alone and that permeates our being. And that's because we are alone. We're trapped inside a crystal prism and we are just watching light pass through it, following light as it moves around us in a circle backwards and then forwards through all time. And perhaps there's all kinds of other observers beside us or perhaps we're alone, but we'll never know. And so really, what else can you do but eat, drink, be merry for tomorrow. We die. Thank you for joining me for this discussion on Mythamite. Mythamite, there we go. Uh, Mene monadism. We discussed the origins of the theory, where we looked at that initial car ride and how it developed into the idea of uh, the memory mind of one and being kind of just in that one spot in space. We discussed the prism prison and how that relates to ourselves kind of inside this hologram where we only have the illusion of time, movement, and even perhaps life. We discussed the Vitruvian man, which I will go actually in more in depth. I, I simplified it. I left out the observer Vitruvian dichotomy. And so um, I'll be covering that in the advanced lecture, but uh, this was a hyper simplified version. We also discussed the shadow play, which may be our way out, the exit, or no exit, <laughs> if you're an optimist or pessimist. And then we discussed the known unknowns and there's a lot with this one because of our limits of science and abstraction. Right? So, yeah. Anyways, thank you for joining. I'll be covering more in the advanced lecture. So if you like that, please make sure you tune in to uh, watch that one as well. I'm going to be just talking about myself for a bit here. So feel free to shut off the video at this point because you've seen everything I have to offer. All right. Today I'll be discussing a anime I like. Oop, anime. I will be discussing a um, animal, and I will be discussing a uh, oh a type of alcohol. There we go. Yeah. I don't actually drink very much, but there's a one I'll I'll do that. We'll stick with the A's. Uh, I will also talk about a horror book, uh, or maybe just horror media, I don't know, maybe it'll be a movie. Uh, and I'll do fantasy, and we'll do romance today, sure. And then um, I also will discuss um, uh, a... Uh, I'll talk about some of my books. Yeah, I'll, I'll for a change of just instead of just uh, 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 books that uh, I'll talk about. Um, uh, I'll 
I'll talk about my my plays. I'll talk about my um, game system. And I'll talk about uh, one of my novels. All right, so anime. Um, I think, oh, geez, what's a good anime that I could do, talk about? Mm, I don't know. Uh, space Dandy. Yeah, Space Dandy. He's a dandy guy in space. It's really funny. It's a good comedy anime. Uh, I think, you know, if you like some of the stuff I discuss in this, um, you're definitely going to like uh, Space Dandy. Because, I mean, it's it's like, on one hand, it's really funny, but on the other hand, it actually deals with a lot of the kind of the, the things I talk about in these lectures um, with, like, science fiction and, uh, you know, like, existence and quantum possibility drives and, you know, warp travel and all that kind of stuff. So it's it's very, very interesting fantasy, uh, science fiction kind of fantasy, um, but also very fun. Like, it's funny, and you will hopefully laugh, because I, I laughed. And uh, it had some sad parts. It had some funny parts. You know, the guy is kind of a doofus, and he's always trying to, you know, uh, you know, get girls, but he always fails. So it's kind of like Johnny Bravo in space, but... Um, He's more likable than Johnny Bravo, um, I think, anyways. Animals, I really like raccoons. Um, they are really adorable. I used to live down south, and they were everywhere. Up here, we don't have any. Um, but, yeah, they, I would throw food garbage into my backyard so I could feed the crows and the raccoons and the um, uh, the magpies and skunks. And I was like Dr. Doolittle of the, the, the street animals. Um, cause you know, just cause they're, you know, you know, uh, uh, nuisance marmots doesn't mean they, they don't deserve love. So yeah, I, I, there was like a family of raccoons I was feeding for a while. Uh, my neighbors hated that. Yeah, it was, uh, it was bad, but, uh, it was, I was kind of the house where like, uh, if you lose your Frisbee in the backyard, you just kind of leave it. Uh, but yeah, that was, that was me. Uh, I was, uh, that was my life. So I, um, I had, uh. Yeah, I had uh, I, I have a great love of raccoons. I think they're cute. I like their mischievousness. I don't like it when they rip everything apart and they're you know you know kind of a, a little buggers. But um, I uh, they're they're cute animals. You know I, I kind of like them. Uh, alcohol. I don't drink actually that often. I drink maybe a few times a year. But I do enjoy uh, my uncle has a great taste in scotch and he likes expensive scotch and so I actually I will drink scotch if it's his expensive good scotch but I don't drink just to drink because it's just it's boring to me and a waste of money and I mean I, I, I've worked in uh, um, psychoanalysis and addictions treatment and what have you for long enough that I see what you know, once you've seen, you know, some of the awful things you see with addiction, you kind of, you know, you don't really, uh, you lose a taste for a lot of it. So, uh, so which is, I guess, a good thing because, you know, yeah. Um, but yeah, scotch, uh, expensive. Um, I like uh, the Glen Fittich. I think that was the last stuff we had and it had the kind of this peaty taste. Oh, it was delightful. So, yeah. Anywho. Uh, let me see, a, a good novel I like, it's a horror, oh, Dead Zone, uh, a good movie too, actually the movie, I'll talk about the movie, uh, I have the book, I have a first edition of it, but I've actually, uh, it's, it's too scary, um, to read, because it's more than two hours, and I don't like being scared for that long, so I might actually just try to get the audio book, and just try to listen to it, but, um, like, it's such a scary book, I have to keep putting it down. So, um, that's Stephen King, though. You know, he writes such good stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, he's just a brilliant, brilliant guy. And uh, I really, I really like his work. Well, I like a lot of his work. I don't like all of it. But uh, Dead Zone, I, I think, you know, that's okay, though. You don't have to like everything somebody writes. You know, I don't even like everything I've written. You know, some of my stuff, I'm like, just, oh, wow, that was a stinker. But, you know, whatever. You just write it and write something else and, and pick yourself up and do that. Anywho, uh, yeah, so in fantasy, um, Elric of Melnimide. Oh, yes. I have just finished 
volume one on Audible. I, I love Audible. I think I've talked about that before, that I, I, I struggle to read uh, uh, books. And if they're fiction, I, I, I can read a dictionary or a textbook uh, cover to cover in like a day. But you give me like a, a novel, forget it. I've been trying to get through, what is it? Uh, anyways, back to Mel Elric and Bell Nimiday. Uh, it's by Michael Moorcock. And um, it is so good. It's like heavy metal Conan. He's got a cursed sword named Stormbringer that eats souls. I probably already talked about this one on here, but uh, yeah, it's a real treat if you have not already enjoyed the uh, the pleasure that is Eric of Mel Nimiday. Also, just like really cool stuff with like the quantum uh, kind of physics stuff where they have the eternal champions. So Elric and his other counterparts like Hawk Moon, they, they exist across all these different worlds, but they're all the same kind of like soul. So really neat stuff. Um, but um, yeah, I don't want to give away too much, but uh, you know, that's uh, that's kind of just the canon stuff of the, that's on the, the box, uh, or the book covers. Um, so yeah, hopefully some people pick up some Elric and Mel Nimide because uh, I just pre-ordered the volume two on Audible too. Uh, so I can't wait to listen to that. Romance. Uh, I actually have a, I have a guilty pleasure with romance. So I'm going to talk about Take Me Back. It's by Megan March. And it is uh, like, you know, like you, you see romance and you think it's going to be like people like harping and standing outside the windows with like boom boxes. This is like Tom Clancy with like really good sex scenes. Like there's gunfights and there's violence and sex and death and it's it's really good. And I mean, you know, it's it's just uh yeah, it's a really good one. So that's my Megan March, take me back. Um and uh the I, I like I said I do the audibles of these, so uh it's 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 really good though. So I mean if you have never read romance before and you want something that's you know give it a try i mean this one's really good it's you know it, i completely realized that i i had a very closed mind towards it until i actually got into reading some romance and now i i, I read quite a bit of it actually or listen to quite a bit of it but um you know you don't listen to it in public or or have family over when you put it on your your your, uh, your bluetooth speaker because it is uh, pretty raunchy um, well, it's not like obscene, it's not like erotica, but it, it has some parts where you don't want to have that playing loudly at the gym. So, yeah. Uh, and now talking about some of my stuff. Uh, so plays, yeah, I used to write plays, um, quite a bit. Uh, that was my big thing. I did a drama degree, as you guys saw today. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I had one that was done called Pinky Swear. Um, and that was probably my better plays, of my best play. Uh, I, I don't really write them anymore now. I, I mean, um, I don't think I've heard one in years. I, I think I've done a few monologues, but I uh, I don't really bother with theater that much anymore. But um, yeah, Pinky Swear was probably my, my best uh, theater play. Uh, I made a game system, not a video game system, an our old playing game, 9413, uh, Warfare and role-playing, it's abbreviated to war. <laughs> I know, super clever. Um, and it was um, trying to blend squad-based war, like top, like big uh, war game kind of style battles, strategy battles, tactical battles with um, uh, having also the ability to do uh, kind of like smaller skirmishes like in D&D. &D. Um, it didn't do very well. I actually eventually just pulled it from the market because um, I just didn't really sell any and I didn't get very good reviews and, you know, it was very derivative. I feel like sometime, someday I might try to do a, a re-release of it, but I, I don't like to, or a second edition where I clean it up kind of like they did with D&D. &D. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it was really cool because it was all my homebrew stuff. I had to sanitize a lot of it for the um, the book, though. Um, like I had these, um, like, uh, you know, I, I, a lot of my, my players would complain cause I, I use so much homebrew, but I would just call things the same names as in D and D. So like, I'd like, oh, it's a dwarf or it's an elf. And in my books, elves are, uh, like what 
I, I would tell players were elves were like space genetically engineered space, um, like uh, fascists that would um, like, they, they would like kill people for having like, they're too short. Like, sorry, you're too short. You, you, or they'd exile people and uh, they were actually all monosexual. So they, they'd, they would only reproduce by um, in, like in fertilizing themselves. And I, I, and I, when I released it, I, I changed a lot of it for the, the book to, cause I was like, you know what? I don't, I don't know if, you know, um, uh, the world would be, uh, I don't know if people would want to have a role playing game where it's like, oh yeah, you, your character, if they, you know, are, are, if they have a, a love affair with another elf, loves another elf, that's considered like a taboo. Um, it, it's kind of, it was kind of interesting. So yeah, but yeah, I got to express a lot of that, uh, get, just give my weird and my fantasy books. So th I, I do explore a lot of that stuff with my, um, um, my fantasy books is my, my way to kind of be able to, you know, express it, uh, in, in its full weirdness. So I have my koala bear people and, uh, I have, uh, I had these dwarves in my, my role playing system is what I call them, but they weren't dwarves. They were living bundles of hair that grew from tubers. And the, the hair was like, um, prehensile. They, these, these tubers of kind of, uh, like flesh ish. Uh, it wasn't even flesh. It was actually kind of like a, uh, like they, they were actually silicon based life, but I just called them dwarves. Cause it's kind of like, you know, like when you are trying to get your kids to eat broccoli, you go, Oh, here comes some airplane or you're just cheese whiz, you know, Oh, it's, it's not, uh, it's deep fried, it's wings. It's not deep fried broccoli or uh, cauliflower. So I do that that kind of stuff. I'm like trying to, you know, get my my players to try this new thing, but I'd have to just call it. Oh yeah, these are boneless wings, not just chicken tenders or whatever. Uh, when you're on a chicken bender, grab yourself a chicken tender. Toot -toot -toot. <laughs> um, and yeah, then um, last uh, I'll just talk a bit about. Um, I guess I was already segueing into my novels, so I did uh, Euroger Mons. Um, so that was my most recent fantasy and I'm doing, um, my sequel to Oslev and the first three letters, we'll see if somebody can guess it in the comment section, B-A-L. There we go. So if somebody can guess that, then, uh, I don't know, maybe I'll find a way to send them a free copy of my book or something. Anyways, um, so yeah, uh, anyways, back to Yorgamons. That's my fantasy one where I got to explore. Um, I actually have my koala bear people in it. Um, and so what these koala bear people are, they, they actually, um, they, they are symbiotic with the trees they live in and the trees actually hold their memories. And so this one koala bear woman, her tree was destroyed. And so like her, she's had, like amnesia because they're not used to having memories because they're really smooth brained animals or people, I guess, and they're people animals. Um, and so that's one of the races is these, um, the koala bear people. And then I also have a, um, uh, the, the, uh, the space uh, elves, they're actually called, they're, they're called sirens. They're also called effin. Um, and so what they are is the, um, uh, kind of uh, the they they only are supposed to you know they, they grow they're immortal right and uh, through genetic engineering they they can only be killed and they regenerate and um, really rapidly so like they, they're hard to kill um, and there's all kinds of really cool stuff about them I won't get want to give away but uh, it's a stranded astronaut one of these one of these um, uh, space elves. Um, is uh, basically stranded on this planet and um, they're, uh, you know, like, it's like, ugh, you know, they, they always wanted to visit the the colony planets, these like, you know, backwaters. And now she's like trapped on one. And then I have a, my half, uh, my, my equivalent of the, the half elf is um, they basically to re maintain reproductive health, they have sequential hermaphrodism. So they'll shift from male to female, to female, to male, to male. 
um, uh, throughout their lifetime, depending on what the needs of the community are. So, like, if there's too much man pheromones, then a bunch of the dudes are going to become chicks. Um, so, it, it's pretty pretty cool, pretty far out. Um, so yeah, that's your ogre mons. Those are the kind of the, the races that I kind of like to explore in my books. So, um, kind of like, uh, kind of neat stuff, but anywho, that's about it. So, uh, thanks for sticking around if you did. And uh, if you want to please buy some of my books, um, because, uh, I kind of just, like I said, I, I want to move out to the forest and live in a cabin, just get away from everything and uh, write my books and work on my theories and just, uh, yeah, maybe I could feel happy again. Anywho, thanks for tuning in. And um, as always, be seeing you.